Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our lecture, Capitalism in the Age of Digitization. It is the first event on our subject for 2018, The Future of Capitalism, a Vision. The statement made by the English title, The Multiple Futures of Capitalism, perhaps encapsulates its idea behind it best. In terms of the technological and social developments, many future forms of our economic system are conceivable. Even complete failure is something that some consider as an option. Crises in the financial sector, high sovereign debt, prices of tangible assets inflated by zero interest policies, shaky banking systems such as that in Italy on the one hand, and above all the phenomenon of digitization on the other are seen as a threat. But is the world really a worse place than it used to be? Is capitalism really doing so badly if we look at the world as a whole? Is capitalism in a crisis? How does the line of development of America and the world look if we look back at human prosperity over the centuries? Today, the world is a hundred times more prosperous than it used to be 200 years ago. And what's important in this context is that the prosperity is more equally distributed across countries and social strata. According to Steven Pinker, devastating famines are getting rarer and the battle against malnutrition is making progress. In the developed countries, inequality is on the rise, but what's more important is that poverty is not rising. Let us look at the educational system. 200 years ago, 12% of the world's population could read and write. Today, it's 83% and rising. Better education, prosperity and health have made the world population an average of 30% IQ points smarter than their ancestors. In China, we are seeing a departure from communism heading towards capitalism. China's state capitalism is exemplary in the digital sector. American giants like Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, respect Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent WeChat. China is in the process of becoming the world's economic leader. And that is also a sign that something's right about the capitalist system. But certainly not everything is right. This year, we want, Convoco wants, to think about how capitalism needs to change so that it continues to be a successful model for our society. We've made a conscious choice to use the word capitalism. It is ideologically charged, and as soon as you hear it, it invites contradiction. But in our issue here, what we are looking at is developing new approaches that will help as more people than do at the moment participate in capitalism and profit from it. Those for whom the concept of capitalism is too ideologically charged can replace it through the neutral term market economy. Classically defined, capitalism means radical subordination to the law of the market. In view of the many government interventions in the market, one might even get the idea that we don't have any capitalism at all anymore. Perhaps the response at the end of our Convoco year might be a return to a more pure, a more real capitalism. And this is also something we need to discuss. The hallmark of capitalism is the accumulation of capital in the hand of private owners. Karl Marx, whom one cannot fail to mention in this context, saw this as a re-emergence of feudalism. Because although a worker in the capitalist system has the freedom to choose whom they want to work for, they definitely do not have 
a share of ownership of the means of production in most cases. These are held in the hands of the few. Over the last century, however, this view has changed. In the eyes of Max Weber, for example, modern capitalism differs significantly from the ideas of Marx. Weber describes it as a rational endeavor carried out in accordance to formal laws, such as the laws of the market, which involves all people. We are all well aware that today we are confronted with a world which, in view of technological developments, is changing faster than ever before. But the question remains as to how these technological developments impact on the market economy. And that is why we are opening this year with the issue of capitalism in the age of digitization. In principle, our economy should grow through the new technologies. This is how it always was in the past. And this is how it should be through the more efficient use of digital networks. At the moment, however, the question on everyone's minds is what is happening on the labor market? How is labor changing? Is it really the case that 50% of all jobs in the USA will be made redundant through artificial intelligence? No one knows the answer to this question. Certainly, jobs will be eliminated. But at the same time, new ones will emerge in industries we cannot even imagine today. And this is something we can state as an extremely likely situation. Let's look back in history. What took place after the invention of the automobile? Yes, there was a recession in agriculture as the number of horses declined rapidly and this decimated the assets of many American farmers. And at the end, this impacted on the entire American economy. But after this, there were countless positive effects. For example, a completely new economic sector of consumer credits emerged because cars through mass production suddenly became affordable for normal consumers. At the end, the economy grew through these technological developments. Digital networks should actually be the ideal breeding ground for a positive capitalism that should lead to more prosperity for all. They are decentralized and can make information available very quickly. However, what we're seeing is that digital networking so far has weakened every one of our industries, ranging from media to medicine to industrial manufacturing. Let me illustrate using two examples how this has come about. Investors on the stock exchange value $1 turnover of online retailer Amazon at roughly $3.50. For retail group Walmart, on the other hand, $1 is only worth 68 cents. So $1 of turnover for Amazon is valued as five times more valuable than $1 turnover for Walmart. And this, although turnover and profit and margin of Walmart are considerably higher. This phenomenon has to do with the value of data. Amazon has far more data from its consumers and uses these very, very differently than Walmart does. Instagram is not worth billions of dollars because it produces something extraordinary. Its value comes up far more through the fact that millions of users contribute to the network without being paid for it. Networks only become valuable when a large number of people participate in them. This is what's known as the network effect. From this value, however, only a very small group profits, 
And this is quickly reminiscent of Marx's worry about feudalism. Wealth is becoming increasingly centralized. This limits economic growth as a whole. We see that major assets are emerging, while at the same time the economy is not growing but rather shrinking. What we see is that both capital ratio and wage ratio are declining, and this is a phenomenon that shouldn't really be possible. We, as consumers and users, want free online experiences. To get them, we accept that the data that we deliver is not paid for. We are confronted with a concentration of data and with it a concentration of wealth and power. However, we have to accept the fundamental fact that capitalism only works if there are enough successful people who can continue to be consumers in the sense that they transform business opportunities into lifestyles. Through this process, inhabitants become citizens. It is therefore key for a stable market economy that there be a large middle class. And here it is worth considering whether one can simply assume the existence of a middle class or whether the continued existence of a middle class needs to be nurtured. Do we have to actively work towards its emergence and its continued existence? Great wealth lasts. It passes from generation to generation. Unfortunately, the same is also true for poverty. But it is doubtful whether this is also true for the continued existence of the middle class. What we are also observing is that when the working class and the middle class remain static and only the upper class develops on, we can get situations that lead to revolutions, just as Marx described. A lack of social mobility causes stasis and this leads to revolt. Naturally, we are not currently facing a revolution. However, we are observing phenomena such as emerging nationalism, populism and extremism. In the US, for example, the middle class is shrinking significantly. We are increasingly seeing the structure, the winner takes it all. We therefore need to consider whether technology networks are making capitalism better or worse. The big question when it comes to the puzzle of the market economy is how prosperity that supports the middle class can emerge organically rather than only leading to greater prosperity for a few. The hallmark of markets is decentralization of decision-making processes. In markets, information flows from everyone to everyone else. But at the moment, it looks as if individuals were being spied on without receiving any compensation for the, their data which is being siphoned off. The buzzword here is disruption. The digital network technology undermines the modern idea of markets and market economy. A market economy ought to bear in mind everyone who contributes to value creation. This would make capitalism more real and more true. What we have to achieve is that every individual become the economic owner of their data. Internet philosopher Jérôme Lanier speaks in this context of a world in which there is digital dignity. The aim ought to be that in the moment 
in which the individual makes an economic contribution through their data that they participate in value creation. They have to get something back in return, perhaps in the form of a nano payment. That would motivate people and also reward them for contributing to the data economy. I recently had the great privilege of meeting Tim Berners-Lee. He is considered the inventor of the World Wide Web and is a professor at MIT. He told me that he was working on a technology that ensures that everyone is master of their own data in the sense that the individual benefits from the use of their data, not just companies, as is the case today. The individual should benefit, just as companies do, from better findings and better decisions through the help of their own data. But since we're not there yet, there are already approaches about data sharing, though these are still not very satisfactory. From 2018, for example, in the EU, banks have to pass on customer data to their competitors. At the moment, we are not doing justice to modern capitalism. The data economy is leading much more to a new form of feudalism. We are seeing a concentration of power in the hands of the few who have data at their disposal. MIT professor David Autor speaks of what he calls superstar firms. These make profits that break every record in history. 2015, just six shares were responsible for the rise of NASDAQ. And five of these are superstar firms. Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Netflix. The stock market value of Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook corresponded in 2008 to the gross national product of Poland. 2017, the stock market value of these four companies had already overtaken the GNP of India. Worldwide, there are only six countries whose gross national product is higher than the stock market value of these four companies. This concentration of power is disputed hotly. Happily, these four companies are competitors, and one can only hope that they will keep one another in check. An economy is like a cosmology. A growing market is like a growing universe. Growth is necessary in a healthy market static or even shrinking economies cause people to become cruel and egotistical as the battle for the allocation of resources increases. In the last year, we discussed at Convoco about the bonum commune, the greater good or public interest. The key idea here was how important the community is for social well-being that the collaboration of people with the help of gigantic computer networks ought to lead to more prosperity for humanity as a whole. And this should be the aim of today's market economy. How we might get to that point is something that will be discussed today by Professor Clemens Furst, head of the IFO Institute for Economic Research, and Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger from the Oxford Internet Institute. A warm welcome, Professor Fust, and a warm welcome, Professor Meyer Schoenberger. I'm pleased that you're here. Victor Meyer Schoenberger, ladies and gentlemen, just published a book on this subject called Das Digital, or The Digital. In this book, at the end, he says that thanks to data wealth, our future will become more personal, more efficient, and more sustainable and above all, more community-based. 
Let us all work towards that end. Thank you.